Hi, I'm Pastor Rob Swinsberg. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church Bible Study on the book of Genesis. We've been looking at the book of Genesis and following the fascinating story of Isaac and Jacob. And so I'm glad that you uh, joined. I hope all is well with you today. Uh, hope and pray that you are doing well during this time and God's safety be with you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your many blessings, not only your physical blessings, but the blessing of prayer, the blessing of your Holy Spirit, the blessing of your peace and love and joy. And so be with us as we continue to study your word. May your spirit guide us and direct us into all areas of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin the study today by sharing a couple of verses with you. Um, sometimes people say to me, Pastor, why should we study the Bible? Or I could study the Bible by myself. And so as we continue in the book of Genesis, there are just two verses I'd like to share with you. First from 2 Timothy 2.15. And God's word says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so one of the reasons we study the scriptures is to be approved by God, not to be approved by the pastor or by your family or by the church, but when we study God's word, God is very, very happy. So 2 Timothy 2.15 reminds us that we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. And then in 1 Peter 3.15, God's word says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. And then listen to this part. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness <clears throat> and respect. And so God tells us that we are to not only know what we believe, and that's where the study comes in, but then secondly, we're to share that with people. We're to always do that in a spirit of gentleness and with respect. Well, let's get back to our story in Genesis. Then Rachel and Leah replied, by the way, just to give you a little bit of background, Jacob has left Laban. He has taken Rachel and Leah uh, with him and the children, and they are departing, uh, so to speak, the homestead of Laban uh, to go out and to find his own place in the world with his own family. And so there is this discussion about the inheritance. Then Rachel and Leah replied, do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and to our children. So do whatever God has told you. So there is a, a sense in a moment for Rachel and for Leah and for Jacob to kind of justify uh, for what was done. Remember the story last week where we talked about Jacob causing his flocks to be numerous, causing his flocks to be strong. However, in the mating of Laban's flocks, his goats and sheep, uh, they were very weak. And so under uh, this particular plan, uh, Jacob increased in his wealth, and uh, Laban, on the other hand, uh, didn't fare so well. And so we, we see in this discussion with Rachel and Leah and Jacob uh, an effort to justify uh, our actions. I would call it today, I deserve it mentality. I got what I want. You know, it reminds me of the story of the Good Samaritan where the person was robbed and the robber's attitude was, what's yours is mine. The two people that walked by, one of them a priest, their attitude was, well, what's mine is mine. I'm not going to share, I'm just going to kind of avoid you and kind of pretend that the the sick man wasn't there. The third person, the Good Samaritan in that story, had the correct 
biblical attitude about material things because he took care of the man, took him to a, a lodge, told the person to give him food, give him lodging, give him medicine, and that he would pay for whatever was left when he came back by. And so in life, you can really divide people into three categories, can't you? There are those who say, what's yours is mine. Then there are people who believe, I deserve it. What's mine is mine. But God calls us to be like the Good Samaritan because God has blessed us. And so what's mine is yours as we share. The other disturbing thing about this passage is this emphasis upon the material, right? The emphasis upon herds and flocks and having great wealth and possessions. One of the things I say to people particularly to people who buy a new car. One of the things I say to them that in about 10 or 15 years, you may be driving down the highway and you may be passed by a flatbed truck that has your car along with about 10 others squished like a pancake. And so we really need to uh, not focus so much on uh, the material. I once heard a pastor say that he never, he never saw a funeral hearse followed by a U-Haul. And so we can't take things with us. We are to enjoy the gifts that God gives us, but we are not to be focused on the material. A couple of statements I found that I thought were very interesting. If material things are what you're talking about when you say, I'm blessed, you have no idea what a blessing is. And I think the point of that, not that God doesn't bless us materially and that when we do receive food and shelter and medicine, I mean, that is a blessing, right? I mean, God blesses us with those things. But being blessed by God goes much deeper than that. It goes to the very heart of our salvation, the grace, the forgiveness that God extends to us. You can't put a material value on that. And so just a reminder to you, the next time somebody says, I'm blessed, or you say to them, I'm blessed, please remember that it's more than just the material things uh, in life. The second statement that I found that I thought was very interesting, if money and material things make you believe that you are better than others, then you are the poorest person on earth. Uh, I really like that. Again, it's de-emphasizing the material, recognizing that uh, to be rich does not mean to be rich in possessions and material wealth and so on and so forth. So we're blessed by God in many, many different ways. We are blessed with our good health, with our food, with uh, all the things we need. But boy, there are so many other spiritual blessings. The gift of prayer, the gift of God's word is a blessing. And then finally, I like this one probably the best. The best things in life are not things. Things get destroyed, things wear out, but God's love and God's protection and God's presence is eternal and everlasting. You know, it was like when the disciples were upset when Jesus told them that he was leaving. And you can understand why they were upset. They had spent three years with him. But Jesus had a better plan. God had a better plan. And Jesus said to the disciples, unless I go to the Father, the Holy Spirit will not come upon you. And so now God is with us, lives within us, whereas in the days of his flesh, Jesus could only be one place at one time. He couldn't be with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and at the same time with his disciples. And so... Uh, the things that we have in life, the best things are not things. So let's remember that, okay? Back to our scripture passage. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all of his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he had accumulated in Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Fear drives uh, Jacob here. 
uh, just a footnote there at the bottom. Uh, it is fear of losing possessions that drives him away. It drives him away from uh, continuing to work with Laban. And you know, in life, when it comes to uh, material blessings, uh, sometimes we are motivated by fear, the loss of, of losing them. Fear that he would lose all of his worldly uh, possessions. Listen, there are some folks today, as I speak down south, who have um, experienced some great tornadoes. And, you know, I mentioned before about uh, not ever finding a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. There's another statement that says that all of your worldly possessions can be hauled away in a U-Haul. And for people that have experienced disasters of floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, and earthquakes, uh, they learn that all the things they've saved for in their lives can be lost uh, in a moment. And so there is this kind of emphasis not so much on the temporary, but to be focused on the eternal. And I hope and pray in these days that you are doing that. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Now we're going to look at that in a minute because uh, this was something interesting that occurred back in those days. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him he was running away. So here's Jacob up to his old tricks again, his deceit, his conniving. And uh, so he just gives this impression to Laban that he and the wives and the children are going to be away for a few days. But he doesn't tell him that he's going all the way to uh, his father's house. And so he fled with all that he had. He crossed the Euphrates River and headed for the hill country of Gilead. So these household gods, what are these household gods? Um, back in biblical days, there were these idols that were kept in people's homes. See, we forget that the Israelites later, God would tell them through Moses in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, let me let you, let you in on a little secret. That passage is really misinterpreted, and there's a word in that passage that changes the whole meaning. In many of our Bibles, it says, you shall have no other gods before me, which can kind of indicate, well, you can have lots of gods, just don't put any other gods before me. But the Hebrew word there really should be translated, you shall have no other gods besides me. That God is number one. God does not share with anyone else. And so we're going to look at a moment. These household gods were called teraphims, and they were kept for many different reasons. Now remember, the Israelites were, as they were established and later became a nation, were monotheistic. They would believe only in one God. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall not make a graven image of any God. All the other nations were polytheistic. They believed in many, many different gods. Interesting, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is walking down the road of Ephesus. He's walking through the town, and he sees all these statues and all these monuments to different gods, the different names of the gods chiseled on each of the monument. And then at the end of the road, there is a monument doesn't have the name of a god on it. But you know what they chiseled in? To the unknown god. See, they just wanted to, to cover their bases. They just wanted to make sure in case they left any god out, they weren't going to offend that god. And so if there's another god, this statue, this monument was erected to the unknown god. And so we see some bad behaviors here. We see Rachel uh, stealing these uh, teraphims, these household gods. Uh, we see Jacob deceiving Laban by taking his wives and children. And so no one has clean hands. Now, I put in quotes clean hands. There is a concept in the law. For any of you 
that will ever go to court who, or who have ever been to court. There's a doctrine in law called the doctrine of clean hands. Let me give, give you an example. If you rob the bank, and you rob the bank of $10,000, and you're walking down the street, and somebody robs you of your money, you can't take that person to court. You can't go before a judge and say, this person stole my money. And by the way, this happens uh, often. Police will tell you that in the area of drugs and drug sales, there are actually cases, nobody said that criminals were smart, but there have been actual cases of people who have been robbed of their drugs and they will flag down a police car and say, that guy down the road, he stole my drugs. You need to go arrest him. And so there is this doctrine in the law known as clean hands. The, the law is not going to reward you if you are guilty of stealing, if you're guilty of deceit. If you're guilty of breaking the law, you're not going to be recompensed for that. So remember the, the, the story of the uh, bank robber and uh, the, the law of clean hands. So these household gods, they were apparently a collection. They were very small. Uh, we know they were fairly small because Rachel uh, hides them. They're idols, and they're referred to in the original Hebrew. Hebrew, the word teraphim is used. And we see in Judges 17 and 2 Kings 23, we also see reference to these uh, household gods. So it raises a question, you know, why would Rachel steal them? And there are several different possibilities suggested by scholars. Uh, perhaps Rachel's reasons were spiritual. Perhaps she thought, yeah, I know the God of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, I know about them, and I know the God of my husband Jacob. But I'm going to have these idols just for good luck just in case, kind of like superstitions, right? The rabbit's foot or the four-leaf clover that we talked about with Laban. And so they may have actually had some spiritual belief uh, in those. And if that was the case, uh, shame on them. You know, we don't put our faith and trust in things, in good luck charms, but we put our faith in God. She might have thought that these gods provided protection or fertility and did not want to lose that by leaving them uh, behind. We know that Rachel worshipped the God of Jacob, at least at times we see in the scriptures, but it's very likely that she and others in her family also worshipped other gods as well as hoping to be blessed by all of them. So remember, this is early in Genesis, you know, we've got to go through the story of Joseph. We've got to go through the story of Moses being born, Moses uh, taking the people out of Egypt before we get to the commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So I was thinking, we don't have uh, any household gods around, do we? Um, or maybe we do. Maybe we do have some superstitions. Maybe there are some things that we put spiritual value and trust in. You know, for some people, it may even be uh, jewelry, crosses or bracelets or things like that, that we hope and pray will protect us or lead us. And uh, by the way, I've learned that, and I have several crosses that I wear. Some of you are aware of that, but you know what I found? that when I'm out in public, that when I'm wearing my cross, I'm more likely to do the right thing and to say the right thing <laughs> and to be more patient with people um, because it's a reminder to me, right, that we are Christians. And, and so uh, if we wear that um, as an example to others and to remind us of our faith, then it becomes a good thing. If you're an athlete, and you wear a cross or you do something before you 
make that foul shot at the end of the game, then it becomes a superstition. And it's not something that we should be doing. It's also possible that Rachel was emotionally attached to these household items. As familiar items from her childhood, she perhaps thought that having them would, would comfort her in leaving behind her homeland. That probably would have been better if she had taken a teddy bear or a blanket or something like that. But a few scholars even suggest that possessing these idols would allow a family member to claim an inheritance uh, when the time came. And so we don't know for sure exactly the reason or all the reasons that Rachel took these household gods. It certainly was not appropriate for her. It certainly showed a demonstration of lack of faith in the God of her husband, Jacob. Most simply, probably most likely, Rachel took these items simply as one last act of rebellion and revenge against her father. We know that the relationship uh, was not good and getting worse by the day and by the month. And uh, there, there is this argument about her father's inheritance, which by the way, we see in families today. I've done many, many, many funerals in 35 years of ministry. And I've been aware of many family situations when upon the death of a loved one, there is fighting about money and about property. And so this may have been a way for her to kind of get back at her father by stealing this teraphim. Let's get back into the scriptures. On the third day, remember there was a third day's journey between Laban and Jacob. And Laban was not aware that Jacob was going to be taking off completely. But on the third day, he was told that Jacob had fled. And taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. But then God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night. And he said, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Good advice, be careful what you say. One of the shows on television that I enjoy watching is a judge show, and uh, there was a court case of a landlord who was given information the day that his uh, tenant was leaving, actually did not give 30 days notice. And so when the tenant, about 26 days short, gave notice to the landlord, the landlord texted back one word and one word only, right? Be careful what you say and what you do. When he received the text, even though it was 26 days, he didn't say good, that's okay. He didn't say bad, it's gonna be a problem. He shared one word, received. Received the text. And so God warns Laban in his anger not to say anything to Jacob, to be very, very careful uh, what you say. And by the way, we live in a day and age where people don't seem to care what they, uh, what they say. They don't care about the language they use. They don't care about the lies that they tell. Um, we really, I think, live very much in a, in a depraved society where it's hard to really determine truth sometimes, isn't it? At least I find it that way. So Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him. And Laban and his relatives camped there too. That must have been a little awkward, don't you think? Then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You've deceived me and you've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Well, not really, right? There's the hyperbole. Really didn't carry them away like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me? so I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of timbrels and harps. Now, I don't know if I really buy that. <laughs> I mean, he would be told that he would be losing his daughters and his grandchildren, and, and so at least in his words, he says, well, 
We wanted to have a going away party for you. And you've deprived me of having this going away party. He says, you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you. But last night, the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you've gone off because you've longed to return to your father's household. But why did you steal my gods? Funny, I don't see in the scriptures where he ran over and kissed his daughters and his grandchildren. Uh, the first thing he says after he talks to Jacob, oh, by the way, what happened to my uh, household gods? Why did you steal them? And of course, at this point, Jacob has no idea what Rachel has done. He says, I was afraid because I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. But if you find anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live in the presence of our relatives. See for yourself whether there is anything of yours here with me. And if so, take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen uh, the teraphim. Be careful what you say and what you do. Uh, so Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent, into the tent of two female servants, right? There's two servants given to them. But he found nothing. And after he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel had taken the household gods and put them inside her camel's saddle. See, when we talk about deceit, see, here's the problem. When we start hanging out with people who use inappropriate language, when we start hanging out with people that are kind of unethical and maybe immoral, we begin to pick up on those things. You know, it reminds me of, of a story of a woman, an illustration of a woman that had a, a parrot. And she was a Christian, but her neighbor next door had a pa parrot, and she was anything but a Christian. She would often hear foul words being spoken next door and so forth. And so she had an idea. When the lady was getting ready to go on vacation, her neighbor, uh, the Christian woman said, let me take care of your parrot. Here, I put them in with my parrot, they'll, they'll get along okay. And the idea was, right, she was thinking maybe some of the good behavior and the good words from my parrot will kind of rub off on the other parrot. Well, you know exactly what happened, that when the lady returned and picked up her parrot and went home, all of a sudden the Christian woman, her parrot, began using foul language. So be very, very careful with the company um, that you keep. So Rachel is deceitful. She hides, she steals, and she hides. Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two female servants, but he found nothing. And after he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods, right, and put them inside the camel's, camel's saddle, and was sitting on them. And Laban searched through everything in the tent, but he found nothing. So I'm sure he was looking around for everything. And then he sees Rachel uh, on the saddle, uh, up on a camel. And I'm sure he's looking everywhere where these things could be hidden. And his eyes come upon uh, the saddle. So here's what Rachel says. Rachel said to her father, don't be angry, my lord. And by that way, the, my lord is not referring to anything spiritual or or theological, it's just an expression of respect and, uh, you know, for somebody who was over you, you would call them my Lord. Don't be angry, my Lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. She says, I'm having my period. And so he searched, but he could not find the household gods. And so she deceitfully hid them. And then she lied about why uh, he couldn't search the saddlebag of the camel and boy, she was, was really uh, picking up a lot of things from Jacob. We're going to finish up here in a couple of minutes. So Jacob was angry and took Laban to task. What is my crime? How have I wronged you 
that you hunt me down. So Jacob becomes angry with Laban. Like, how dare you? How dare you accuse me of doing something like this? He didn't know that he was really wrong. And he says, so what is my crime? How have I wronged you that you must uh, hunt me down? You know, when we make assumptions and presumptions about people and situations, we can be oh so wrong. And I've been wrong many times in, in my life. When I lived in Ohio, I'll give you an example. This is a true story. There was a man across the street, and we would have to walk, oh, maybe 50 yards up the road to our mailbox. The mailbox didn't come down on our little cul-de-sac, but it was up on the main road there. And so our mail, we would have to walk or pick it up when we would drive by. And I noticed one day that my neighbor would walk out of his house, get into his car, drive a few feet, pick up the mail, and then drive back. And he did this a number of times, and I would always walk up to get my mail. And after seeing this behavior for several weeks, you know what I thought to myself? I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but you know what I thought to myself? Boy, that guy is lazy. Instead of walking up and getting some exercise, he has to take his car and go in and, and get the mail. Well, then I discovered one day the car wasn't going up to get the mailbox, I mean, to get the mail. <clears throat> man across the street had died. And you know what I didn't know? That he had had a lung condition, that he had suffered from work. And even though he was younger than I was, he was not able to physically do that. And here I was for weeks, judging him and making presumptions. We need to be very, very careful in our lives when we do that. Let's finish up today. So Jacob was unaware of his faults and his sins. He did many. Uh, how did he wrong Laban? Remember the poem, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And so how did he wrong Laban? Well, we can count the ways that he deceived Laban. The goats and the sheep, the trickery that was done there, permanently leaving Laban without telling him where he was going. More lies, more deception, more deceit. We're going to continue in our study of next week. Remember, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, not ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we, if we are honest, <clears throat> we see ourselves in the words and in the behavior of Jacob and Rachel and Laban. We see our own behaviors. We see our own sins and faults. And so, Lord, remind us that you desire holiness in us. Remind us who we are and whose we are. In the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next week.